continuing this morning our series, Running with the Giants, and today we're talking about the giant in faith, and that is Abraham. And Abraham, you know, we, we look at him as the father and of, of our faith. And this morning, as, as we look at that, I want you to open up your hearts and, and let's, let's really receive the word of the Lord in this place. Father, just speak to us over these next few moments as we look at the life of Abraham in Jesus' name. And we all said, Amen. All right. Well, again, this morning, I'm so glad that you're here with us. And I tell you, I hope that your faith will be stirred this morning. Last week, we talked about David. And you know, when we talked about David, we realized, can I get the podium, please? As we talked about David, we realized that we can overcome the limitations that people set upon us. And you know, there are always going to be people that will put limitations on us. There are always going to be people who will try to define who we are, try to define where we should be in life. They'll try to define what our marriage should be like. They'll try to define who our children should be like. But, you know, we need to go to God and find out, God, what do you want for our life? God, what do you want for our life? You know, in pastoring the church, there are people that would try to define what this church should be. You know, they, and they have good hearts. And, Pastor, we should do this. We should do that. But, you know, the bottom line is, say, God, what do you want us to do? God, what do you, where do you want us to go? It's not about popular opinion. It's about finding out what God's will it's for your life. And so with David, he rose above the limitations. But you know, this morning, we want to look at the life of Abraham. And this isn't going to be on the screen, but if you have your Bibles real quick in Hebrews chapter, Hebrews chapter 11, Hebrews chapter 11, this is what we refer to as the, the faith chapter this morning. In Hebrews chapter 11, we see here, it says that faith is the confidence that what we hope for will actually happen it gives us assurance about things we cannot see. And it says that through their faith, the people in, in days of old earned a good reputation. And you jump ahead to verse 6, and it says, And it is impossible to please God without faith. Anyone who wants to come to Him must believe that God exists and that He rewards those who sincerely seek Him. And this morning, if I want you to know one thing, is that you need faith. If what you're doing in your life right now does not require faith, you are not pleasing to the Lord. I know that's a strong statement, but think about that. Because the Bible says without faith, it is impossible to please God. And there are many people that are living life, they're living life on their own power, they're living life on their own ability. And I tell you, I've realized God wants us to be living on the edge. God wants to be living in that place where, where we're so stretched in our faith that we have no choice but to trust in God. And this morning, I, I hope that we can have that attitude this morning, that we're going to do things that cause us to trust in the Lord. We could, you know, we, I know I've shared this before, but you know, we have property already that, that we had, and we could build on that. But I realized it really didn't take faith. I could, in my mind, on paper, I could, I could figure it out. I could see how we're going to do it. It'd be too small, but we could play it safe. And do it that, but I realized, God, all right, we're, we're gonna we're gonna stretch our faith, God. We're gonna stretch our faith. We're gonna believe, God. We're gonna we're gonna get to that place where, if you're not in it, it ain't gonna happen. And you know that's a good place to be in this morning. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Hebrews chapter twelve verse one has been our foundational verse, and it says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith. Let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up, and let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. And we are running a race. This morning, you are in a race. As you live your life, you are running a race. And again, you're in that stadium, and there are people surrounding you, and they're watching you, and they're, they're cheering you on. And you ran a lap with Noah. Noah stepped off, and you ran the next lap, and it was with David. David stepped off, and this morning, the next person that comes on is Abraham. And Abraham's going to run one lap with you. If Abraham ran that one lap with you, what would this man, this man, what, what would he say to you? I believe this. Abraham would turn to you, and Abraham would say, God always does the right thing. God always does the right thing. You know, when you look at the life of Abraham, it wasn't a necessarily an easy life. God called him out of, from where he lived. You know, when you live somewhere, you got your family there, especially in those days, you know, you probably didn't want to venture out much because it was really with your friends. It was with 
those people that you had protection, you had safety, and yet God called Ab- Abram, in fact was his name at the time, Abram, out and called him to another land. And we see that he went through trials. He, he went through times when he, obviously he took matters into his own, hand, his own hands. But yet Abraham could, could say to us today that God will always do the right thing. And I want you to know this morning in your life, God will always do the right thing. You believe that? Now, we may not always think that. We may have time to say, God, what are you doing? God, this isn't, this isn't what I planned. God, this isn't the way that I think it should happen. But we need to know that God will always do the right thing. Number one, God will always do the right thing, even if it takes a long time. He will always do the right thing, even if if it takes a long time. In Genesis 12, verse 1, the Lord had said to Abram, leave your native country, your relatives, and your father's family, and go to the land that I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you and make you famous, and you will be a blessing to others. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who treat you with contempt. All the families on earth will be blessed through you. You know, this morning, we're blessed because of Abraham. Isn't that, when you think about that, the promise that God made. But even if it takes a long time, God had promised Abraham that he would possess the land of Canaan, that he would have many descendants, and his offspring would become a great nation. But after 10 years, God still hadn't delivered on that promise. 10 years! You know, when we pray and when God gives us a promise, how many of you want it now? And let's, let's just be honest. When you feel God lay something in your spirit, you want it now. We want it five minutes ago. I mean, we are an instant society. We don't like waiting for things. You know, I, um, my wife, one of the things, I don't know why I just, it, it doesn't make me mad. I just kind of wonder, why do you always do that? You know, like, I'll, I'll go to the microwave all the time. And when I use the microwave, There's like two seconds left on the timer all the time. Two seconds left. She never lets it run down to zero. She never lets it beep. You know, I don't know if she thinks she's disarming the bomb, you know, right? Two seconds. But um, I'll say, man, why why don't you just let it beep? She wants it now. As soon as it's ready, she can't wait that extra three seconds. And, you know, with us in life, we want things now. You know, you, you think back in the day when you had something shipped to you, you could wait two weeks. Now, even in Hawaii, you can get things in two days. And sometimes you want it in one day. And yet, I mean, we just want things now. But the promises that God gives us are not on our timetable. They're not on our schedule. You know, you might have went to the marriage retreat and your marriage was bad and you went, you got all the, the tools to fix your marriage and you go back and you want it fixed now. That's a bad idea because you'll probably get into a bigger fight, a bigger argument because we don't get where we are in our life overnight. We don't get out of where we are in our life overnight. You see, we need to trust in God, even when things take a long time to know that God is faithful with us. Genesis 15, 4, the Lord said to Abraham, No, your servant will not be your heir, for you will have a son of your own who will be your heir. Then the Lord took Abram outside and said to him, Look up into the sky and count the stars if you can. That's how many descendants you will have. And Abraham believed the Lord, and the Lord counted him as righteous because of his faith. You see, Abraham said, I don't have anybody. God, what, what about this promise that you made to me? What do you mean there's going to be all these people? God said, go out. You know, last night, if you looked up in the sky, at least where we live, you could see the stars. He said, look out, look at the stars. If you can count the stars, that's how many descendants you will have. You know, it's impossible to count all the stars. You ever go up to Mauna Kea? You can see even more stars. You see the little ones that you can't see down here. It's impossible. God says, look, if you can number the stars, that's the descendants you will have. Will it come? Was it to come in Abraham's lifetime? No, but it was the promise that Abraham had. Was, was God faithful in answering the promise? If we look around today, we can say yes. God was faithful, even if it took the long, a long time. Abraham and Sarah took things into their own hands. And, you know, we, you're familiar with that story. You know, they were old, and Sarah obviously thought, we can't have a son, we can't have a, a, a child at this age. Take the servant, Hagar. Take, take my servant, Abraham, and go have a child with her. Well, Abraham, I guess he happily obliged, and uh, he, he went, and they had a child. 
But that wasn't the way that God wanted it to work. God said it's going to be through who? Sarah. You see, the promise is going to come through Sarah. But they couldn't wait. And I want to tell you today that God's sense of timing is different than our sense of time. And we've got to learn how to trust the Lord in His timing. First Peter, or 2 Peter 3.8 says that one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like a day unto the Lord. You know, it's like the little Timmy was talking to God. He said, God, what's a thousand years like to you? God replied, it's like a second. Well, Timmy thought about it a little more. He said, God, what is a million dollars like to you? God replied, well, it's like a penny. Well, Timmy thought a little longer. He said, God, can I have a penny? God said, sure, just give me a second. Um, just wait a little longer in case someone, okay. See, God's time is different. His timing is different than our timing. But we've got to learn to trust that he's going to be faithful, that God is going to come through in our life, that he will always do the right thing, even if it takes a long time. Even if it takes a long time. Let me tell you the next thing today is that God will always do the right thing, even if what he says is absurd. Even if what God says is absurd, he will always do the right thing. And God is, I was thinking, man, you could almost, you could almost say he's a faithful God, He's, he's the God of the impossible, but you could also say he's the God of the absurd. I mean, there are some pretty absurd things that you read about in the Bible. You remember when Jesus had to pay his taxes? What did he, what did he tell him to do? Go catch a fish. The money's going to be in the fish's mouth. How absurd is that? I mean, really? You know, if I were to come to one of you and I say, hey, you know, um, the building fund, you know, we, we, we're, we're, we're short. And so can you go catch a, can you catch a fish? And when you catch that fish in the fish's mouth there's going to be money. Now, again, if I just came out to you in the blue and told you that, you'd probably be thinking, pastor's losing it, right? I mean, honestly, the guy's going nuts, you know? I I need to find another church because that's absurd. In the natural world, it is absurd, but God does not work according to our thought. And when you look at Abraham and you look at Sarah, God could have found a younger couple. He probably could have found a more fertile couple, but he goes to, to Abraham And he goes to Sarah. Sarah was 89 years old. 89 years old when God says you're going to have a child. That's pretty old. If, 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 you know, you come to me and you want marital, you know, you want some premarital counseling, you know, and you say, Pastor, you know, and you're 89 years old, your husband's 99 years old, and you say, Pastor, I just feel, I feel it's time that we start a family. (laughs) I will probably counsel against that. Okay, at 99 and 89 years old. And, and to do it naturally, right? I'll, I'll be like, you're going to adopt? Even I would think, wow, that's okay, you're going to adopt? No, no, we're going to do it naturally. That's crazy, okay? God chose Abraham and Sarah at 99 and 89 years old. How many know that took some faith? Come on. They didn't have Viagra back then. They didn't have those kind of things. Okay, it took faith. It took faith in God. And here she was, when she heard, when she heard God say that she was going to have a child, you know what she did? She laughed. She laughed. And I don't blame her. I'd have probably laughed too. If I was there, you know, if my, and, and I heard, you know, that's my aunt, you know, my great aunt at, nine, at 89 years old, and someone says she's going to have a baby, I'd probably laugh too. And you'd probably do the same thing, because we, we would say, that's absurd. <laughs> that's crazy. There's no way. I don't know if she laughed because uh, the fact that she was older, the fact that Abraham was even older, but let me tell you what, God wanted his trust. And you know, God's trust comes through the testing moments in our life. When we're tested is when the trust comes. Genesis 18, 14 is when they said, is anything too hard for the Lord? Is even the absurd too hard for the Lord? What will be your response when God calls you to do the absurd? What are you going to say? Will you talk yourself out of it? Will you reason yourself out of it? Or will you do it? Naaman, when he had leprosy, what what was he told to do? He was expecting some prayer. He was expecting something big to happen. And the prophet said, go dip yourself in the river seven times. That's absurd. He refused to do it. The servant said, you know, master, why don't you just listen to this guy? And just see what happens. And he listened and he received the healing in his life. 
It was absurd, but it's what God wanted done. It took faith. And God's going to call you at times to do some absurd things, but I want you to be obedient to the Lord. When you hear God's voice, be obedient because that's the promise working through you. That's, that's faith that's being developed. And number three is this. God will always do the right thing even if we do not understand. Even if we don't understand, God will always do the right thing. And isn't it true in our life that there are moments when we don't understand? We don't understand. We don't understand why we experience this loss. We don't understand why this happened or that happened. We don't understand why maybe a spouse had an affair on us. We don't understand why our children went off and, and they started getting involved in drugs or doing other things. We may not always understand, but I want you to know that God, God can always do the right thing in those circumstances. You know, God told Abraham, after they had their son, after he had Isaac, he told Abraham, I want you to take your son and I want you to sacrifice him to me. I, I want him to be the sacrifice. You think about Abraham at that point in his life. He probably got tired of asking questions, try, trying to reason things out. When you read in the Bible, it says that he just took his son and they began to venture. And they're walking to that mountain to where the sacrifice is to be. And he's going. And I think to myself, what must have been going through his mind? He didn't say anything, but he's had to have been thinking, God, what, what, what really are you planning in this? God, God, what really are you, are you going to make happen? This, this is the promise. God, he's the promise. I don't know if my wife and I can have another child. God, he's my world, and you want me to sacrifice him to you. But even when we don't understand, God will always do the right thing. And you know, it went against everything that God had promised Abraham. And Abraham could have disobeyed and said, no, I'm not going to do it. That's my son. God, it doesn't make sense. God, what you promise will not happen if I do what you tell me to do. But Abraham was just obedient and he obeyed God. And the story goes, he went up, placed his son on the altar. And as he was going to sacrifice his son, heard the voice, no. And Abraham stopped. And really, it was a test from God to see if Abraham was fully devoted, if Abraham was willing to go the extra mile and do what everything God has called him to do. And because of Abraham's obedience, we see that he is the father in the faith. And let me ask you this question this morning. What are you going to do when God says to put your promise on the altar? What are you going to do when, when the dream that you live for your whole life, when, when everything that you were focused for, the time comes when God says, are you able to lay it down? And are you able to obey me? Maybe it's, it's been that business that you've been building your whole life. And God calls you to do something else. God calls, are, are you able to lay it down? You know, it, it amazes me. I, I look at the lives of some pastors who've given up amazing careers, you know, amazing jobs to become a pastor. And I look at that. And again, I understand the call of God, all right? So I, I, I get it. But my natural side, I kind of think, are you crazy? I mean, you're, you're, you're giving that up? to pastor a church? I mean, you're giving up that job. You're giving up that career. That, that's everything you worked for. I mean, you went to college for all of these years and you're willing to give it up to pastor a church? But I, I get the call of God, but it's just the natural side of me that, that thinks that, okay? And, and again, I get it, but I'm, I'm not discounting the call of God. But I, I look at that and I admire that, that they're able to lay it down. They're able to lay the dream down on the altar and to obey God's voice. And this morning, what are you? Where, where would you be when God calls you to place the dream on the altar? Where, where will you be on that? Will you question God? Will you fight God on that? Or, or will you say, God, I'm willing. God, I'll lay it down. I'll lay it down. God, you're calling me to this mission field. I'll go. I'll, I'll be a missionary. You know, you're calling me on this to do this or to do that, to reach these people. I'll go. I'll lay it down. And I'll obey your voice. Abraham obeyed God's voice. And at times, the things that we fought so hard for, we worked so hard for, there's those times that will come when we're just going to have to place it in God's hands. No dream, no relationship, no job, nor any goal should ever come between who we are and obeying God's voice. Abraham learned the secret of walking with God, and it was this, to trust and obey. And this morning, if I could encourage you on that, trust and obey the Lord. Trust and obey. 
Don't try to understand God until you have first obeyed Him. Can I say that one more time? Don't try to understand God until you have first obeyed Him. We're trying to, we're trying to understand and then obey. But I want to I flip that around. Can we just obey? You can try to figure it out later, but just obey what God says. Just two final thoughts is this. Abraham could say about his life is that perfection is not a prerequisite for God to begin his work in our life. We don't have to be perfect. Abraham wasn't perfect. Abraham lied to Pharaoh. He lied to the kings twice. You know, I mean, Abraham, he didn't do always the right things. But that's not a prerequisite today. Is that The prerequisite is that you're able to obey what God says. And Abraham can also say that God's blessings are never earned. He didn't have to earn God's blessing in his life, and neither do you this morning. Are you able to trust and obey, even if we don't understand, even if what God says to do is absurd, and even if it takes a long time? Are we able to trust and obey? Can you bow your hearts with me this morning? And just ask yourself that question, God, what are you speaking to my life through this message? What can I learn from the life of Abraham? You may be here and you've experienced times of testing in your life recently. You, you, you can almost say, man, I have a right to be discouraged. I have a right to throw in the towel. But I pray that you could leave this place knowing God always would do the right thing. Even if I don't understand it, even if it doesn't happen when I think it should happen, God is going to do the right thing. It may be in a relationship. You may be in a place today. I feel there's somebody like that here. That There's somebody in your life, maybe at work, or there's someone that's just saying bad things about you. You've just kept your mouth shut. You haven't defended yourself. I want you to know, trust in the Lord. Let God handle it. God's going to do the right thing in that situation. Because God is faithful. He's faithful. He's so faithful. God, we thank you for your faithfulness this morning. From generation to generation to generation. And God, in our, in our minds our limited thought that we have, God, we can't always comprehend what your plan is. We can't always comprehend your directions. But Lord, may we have a heart this morning that will simply obey your word, simply obey your voice. God, when we hear you speak, that we'll act. When we hear your voice, God, when we hear the whispers, Lord, that we'll be sensitive to that. And we'll act. We'll step out in faith, trusting and knowing, God, that you do the right thing in our life. Thank you for your faithfulness, Lord. May we live lives of faith, live lives energized to do what you've called us to do. And Lord, I, there may be those here today that are in that, that crossroads where you've asked them to put the promise on the altar. Lord, I pray that I have the faith to trust in you even in that, to hear your voice and to follow what you've called them to do. We thank you again, Lord, in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. If you're here this morning and you've never made Jesus...